Truth number one, you don't have to live in fear. Truth number two, you have been redeemed. Truth number three, you are loved and cherished. I have called you by name. You are mine. Truth number three, you are loved and cherished. The enemy of your soul calls you by your sin. Jesus calls you by your name. God is always present and calling to us no matter what we have done or how we feel about him. The lies that we believe matter not to God. He knows how he feels about us, and he loves us and cherishes us no matter what. Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to worship, to sing praises to you, to quiet our hearts in the house of the Lord. Thank you for all these folks that have gathered here today. You have a a message to share. Thank you in advance. Thank you for pie. Thanks for grace. Thanks for life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, greetings. Wonderful to see all your shining faces. Some yawning faces. I preached one time years and years ago. This old boy in the back row sat there the entire message. At the end of the message, he gave me a big old hug. He said, wonderful message, Patrick. <laughs> Amen, brother. <clears throat> What's true about you, friends? It's not a question maybe you ask yourselves often. What's true about you? Two things that are true about me right now. I'm anxious and I'm confident. I'm anxious in my own ability as a person, as a man, but I'm confident in my God. I also know I'm a little sleepy. My bride rolled in about 2 in the morning. 2 in the morning. She was out playing poker with some friends at the casino. I'm just teasing. She was not. She was at a... <laughs> I won't let that go too long. So she was uh, at a concert with some ladies worshiping Jesus. And she wakes up this morning to greet me before I came to church, just bubbly and filled with joy. And she got home at 2 in the morning. <clears throat> What's true about you? I'm sharing this message today as a result of some things that were said in my home, as a result of the work that I do. I'm, I'm a therapist by, by vocation, so I meet with people all day, every day, who come to me believing horrible things about themselves. In my own house, I heard... These words, I am dumb, so stupid. I'm not loved. I've said those things. Any of you ever said those things? The nation of Israel was a rebellious people. We look now in, in the Old Testament and we, we look at the stories of the nation of Israel and we think, what is the matter with those turkeys? God gives them a land of promise. They chose to worship a golden calf. God gives them blessing, honor, and riches. They choose to worship a stick and to rebel against God. We can look back on them today and think, oh, are they stupid? I look back on those stories and I think, well, that's me. That's me. Is it you? I've been given blessing after blessing after blessing, and yet I've turned my back on God more times than I can count. I've cursed the name of God more times than I can count. I've cursed the creation, the human beings he's put on this planet more times than I can count. I don't have a Jesus fish on my car for that very reason. I don't want anybody to know, yet he knows. Isaiah 42 speaks about this rebellious people. A lot of Isaiah talks about the nation of Israel being taken into captivity by Babylon because of their sin. God says, well, I'm just going to pull you out of here, this land of promise for a time, and you're going to be captives. You're going to be in chains. Isaiah 42 talks about this rebellious people. They were stubborn. They would not turn, to, turn back to God even when corrected. 
They were idol, idol worshipers. They were unrepentant. God could have easily just abandoned them, destroyed them, said, forget it. I'm done with these people. This is why I cannot be God, friends. Because if I was God, we'd be walking, driving along the highway and you'd see cars vanish. <laughs> people would be gone. Crispy critters would be happening left and right. Lightning bolts would be falling all over the place. I cannot be God. I would not be good at it. <clears throat> Thankfully, God is God. So Isaiah 42 talks about this idolatrous people, rebellious people. And then Isaiah 43, 1. God says this to his people and to us. We're going to just talk about one verse today. In this one verse, you are going to learn three very simple truths about yourself. You came in here maybe believing something about yourself, but you're going to walk out of here knowing three simple, concrete truths about yourself. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. First truth, we do not have to live in fear. Second truth, you are redeemed. The third truth, you are loved and cherished. So what does this passage have to do with us? This is about the nation of Israel, right? We look back across the Bible, the context of the Bible, we can see ourselves in many of these stories, dare I say most of these stories. If any of us could boldly proclaim, I have never rebelled against God in this moment, I want to create a perimeter around you because I don't want to get hit by the lightning bolt that may shoot down from the sky. <laughs> we have all rebelled. Any of you in this room ever sinned? Maybe this morning? <laughs> Any of you ever turned your back on God? Any of you ever worshiped idols? You know, an idol is just not a stick. It's not just a, a calf or an image. It can be a relationship, a job, money. Have we ever experienced shame? Are any of you experiencing shame right now? Shame sometimes will say, I can't go into that church building. The roof may cave in on my head. Not worthy. <clears throat> you ever felt less than? Not good enough? Unloved? You ever felt like a mistake? Shouldn't even be here. Kyle spoke last week about the accuser, the enemy of our souls who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. His mission is to tear us apart from the inside out so that we are no good to God. That same verse also says, but I, Jesus says, have come to give you life and to give that to you abundantly. So you have a choice, friends. Choose a joy and abundant life or death and destruction. It's a choice we get to make. One of the most powerful weapons in the enemy's hand is shame. Shame is not guilt. Guilt would say to you, man, I did something really dumb. I'm going to go ask for forgiveness. Guilt is something God can use to lead us to repentance. Shame says, man, I have done something really dumb. I am dumb. I made a mistake. I am a mistake. I have failed in this thing. I am a failure. With guilt... I make a mistake, I can seek forgiveness. With shame, I am irredeemable beyond God's touch, God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness. It's too late for me. I can't tell you how many times I've connected with people who have said, I'm beyond God's forgiveness. I've sinned way too many times. I've done way too many bad things. It's too late for me. That's a lie. If you're believing that you're beyond God's forgiveness, you're believing a lie, friends. The lies, I am irredeemable, I am worthless, a failure, stupid, unlovable, unwanted, undesirable. People's judgments about me are true. What they say about me is true. I make everyone's life worse. I deserve to be treated poorly. I deserve to be in this abusive relationship. I deserve to be bullied. 
I can't tell you how many victims of domestic violence I have spoken to over the years that would say to me, I deserve to be in this position. I don't deserve any better than this. Hogwash. It's a lie. Nobody wants me. I may as well cut myself off from everyone and everything, including my life on this planet. Isaiah 43, 1. What's true about me? I don't have to live in fear. I have been redeemed. I am loved and I am cherished. Three very simple, concrete truths. If you're here today with any of the beliefs that I had mentioned previous to these three very important ones, you're believing a lie, friends. The lie that you are not worthy and not good enough is a lie show just a brief video. <clears throat> Satan has a roaring lion, he's on the prowl, convincing people his label is true and permanent. He seeks to defeat us either through shame at our label or pride in our label. But God provides for us a new identity. He calls us loved, forgiven, justified, accepted in Christ. He calls us by our names, and he calls us to himself. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid our sins in full. The redemption he offers is so much more than just erasing the sins of our past. It's also giving us a new identity, today and forever. Yes, Satan continues to battle. Christians and churches sometimes struggle. The courts and legislatures are attempting to redefine right and wrong. But the gospel changes lives. And it is only the gospel that can change lives. The world and the devil may want to label us, but it is the creator who gets to define and name his creation. You are not who the world says you are. You are who God says you are. We fear because we believe a lie. We believe a lie about how God sees us, what's true about God. By definition, fear is a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, pain, whether the threat is real or imagined. What do you fear, friends? Noah, my, my son, he came home and they were teaching about phobias in school, fifth grade. He's rattling off this list of about 100 different phobias that people may have. What do you think topped the list? Spiders, man. What's up with spiders? People are terrified of spiders. Do you know public speaking? People are terrified of public speaking. People would rather die than speak in public. <laughs> I feel that just about every time I'm asked to preach. I would rather drop dead than accept this invitation to speak about anything because it's terrifying. Truth number one, we do not have to live in fear. We do not have to live in fear. What are we afraid of? Family getting hurt. Jennifer was out. Like I said, she got home about 2 in the morning. I couldn't sleep worth of beans because I wonder, is she okay? I fear for my bride. Worried about my kids getting hurt? Fearful? So we set up boundaries. Sometimes I want to send out Haley and Noah wrapped in bubble wrap and pillows and duct tape. If you ever want to know about what um, overprotective parents are like, my daughter will gladly fill you in. <laughs> she will bend your ear. Just make sure you pack a lunch. <laughs> Fear of losing my job. Politics, economy, turmoil in the, in the world, the country. If I watch the news more than 10, 20 minutes a day, I'm just all anxious, nervous. The list goes on and on and on. Fear is something I have dealt with all my life, friends. Always have this inward fear. 
So there's these two quotes that I love. I've shared them before. Winston Churchill said, fear is a reaction, courage is a decision. Nelson Mandela, I've learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man or woman is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Fear will cause you to stay in the closet in the fetal position. Courage will get you out the front door. What do you fear today? Truth number one, you do not have to live in fear. Fear will keep you from becoming all God has called you to be. God has called me to preach. He called me about 1996. Came out to Colorado to go to Bible college with that intent to learn about Bible and how to be a good preacher. So I went through all that. Yet every time I'm asked to speak or preach, internally it's always, nope, I got other things to do. I'm pretty sure I'll have a cold that day. <clears throat> Drums. God's gifted me with the ability to play drums, love to play drums. When Isaac puts me on the schedule to play a pair, my first instinct is always say, nope, busy that day. Put my toenails. Whatever it is, I'm busy that day. What if I get up here and a stick goes flying and impales someone in the eyeball? That's terrifying to me. What if I mess up? If I get the beat wrong? What if people recognize this guy stinks? Leading. Leading others. For some reason, God over the years has called me into these leadership positions. Never asked for one time. And yet I keep getting put into these positions. I don't want to lead other people. I keep telling my daughter she's a natural leader. She, I don't want that. So by fear, if I lived in fear, I wouldn't do any of these things. Thus stifling the gifts that God has given to me. So what's the opposite of fear? We know the truth. We don't have to live in fear, right? Right? What's the opposite of fear? Any ideas? Just toss them out. Oh, come on. Toss them out. Yell. Oh, my daughter. She's brownie points. She knows. It's, it's love. The opposite of fear is love. 1 John 4, 18. There is no love and there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. 2 Timothy 1.7, love this verse. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline. Would you rather live in fear or in power? That's like asking, would you rather have boiled chicken or fried chicken? Come on. Psalm 118.6, the Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? They can take my life. You take my life today, that's cool. I get to go to heaven, get a new body. No more husky pants. No more worrying about how much chicken I eat. There's going to be a bucket of chicken in heaven. I know it, and it's going to be filled all the time. I just know, not boiled chicken. No broccoli in heaven either, friends. Fried chicken. <laughs> Psalm 46, 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Psalm 41, 10. So do not fear. Are you getting the message yet? Do not fear. I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you, will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Above my desk in my office at home, I have this picture of a lion. I like to look at the lion. It reminds me of the lion of the tribe of Judah. He was fierce to save his people. It reminds me of how fierce my God is, how jealous he is of his people, desiring to see our salvation and redemption. Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You do not have to live in fear. That is either true or God is lying. You don't have to live in fear. 
the majority of people that I connect with every day as a therapist are bound by fear. Fear of making decisions, fear of stepping out, fear of trusting, fear of hoping, fear of believing that something could be good about me. Lies. Truth number one, you do not have to live in fear. Truth number two, you have been redeemed. I keep forgetting I have glasses. Do any of you need glasses? You know, they help us see. Sometimes I forget that I have them. It's amazing. <clears throat> Truth number two, you have been redeemed. Rabbi Zacharias says, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. It will cost you more than you want to pay. We have a debt that we are unable to pay. Nothing we can do will get us into heaven. So Jesus had to pay that debt. We couldn't do it on our own. I thought as a kid that if my bad, my good outweighed my bad, my red checks outweighed the black checks, whatever that is, I would be okay. At the end of the day, if the scales showed up in my favor, golden. If they did not, I was hosed. That's not a good, fun way to live, friends. It's impossible. To be redeemed means to be freed from something that causes harm, to be freed from captivity by payment of a ransom, to extricate, to fully rescue. This is what Jesus did for us. He didn't just half redeem you. He full on redeemed you. He didn't just half forgive you. He full on forgave you. He didn't just half give you grace. He full on gave you grace. How do you want to live? Half redeemed or full on redeemed? Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Or it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Psalm 3, 23 through 25, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Is anyone in here today not all? Don't go raising your hand because I don't want to see you getting fried. All are justified by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. There's not oftentimes I get to say the word propitiation. It's a really cool word. What it basically means is payment, atonement. You've been paid in full. Sins have been covered to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Jennifer and I, we moved to Colorado years and years ago, back in 1997 to go to Bible college. So we moved into this really tiny, single wide mobile home. It was no bigger than the toaster oven on our counter at home right now. We wanted to carpet this place because it was, it was kind of not good looking. It wasn't very aesthetic. So we got some new carpet for some strange reason though. I think it was probably Jennifer's idea. We picked out this awful looking green carpet. You remember the carpet? It was very green. It looked like a pine tree that you'd hang on your rear view mirror. It was very green. So we packed all of our furniture. Didn't have much. This was a tiny, tiny place. Packed all of our furniture in the kitchen. I had to go to work at five in the morning the day they were going to lay the carpet. And so I left my precious bride seated in the middle of the living room all alone, sitting on a pillow, I think. She wasn't happy. She was about as happy in that moment as she was the first year of our marriage when I got her a thigh master for Christmas. She was not thrilled with that purchase, and she was not thrilled with me leaving her at five in the morning for the carpet guys to get there. There's been a few times in my life where I haven't judged my wife very well. Didn't handle things so well. So the bottom line, though, is they installed this carpet, got home, very green. It was, like, way green. We went to, actually, we, we paid the bill before they installed it. But in a couple weeks, I said it wrong in the first service, they sent us a check for the full amount of the carpet. And I thought, what happened? I called them up. I said, why, why are you sending this, the, the check? Well, the, the bill was already paid. It was paid twice. Well, no, it wasn't. I looked at our bank statements. There was no sign that we paid. I wouldn't pay something twice, 700 bucks. That was a lot for us just starting out. 
No, the bill was already paid. It was paid twice. This is a refund. To this day, I don't know what happened. Can't explain it. We went out and got some chicken that night, though, because they had a $700 check. <laughs> 700 bucks to a young couple going to Bible college, pretty big deal. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Redemption, freedom, victory, release from captivity. The story of the prodigal son, one of the greatest redemption stories of all time. I want to take a look at it from the position of the mom and dad, Mr. and Mrs. Prodigal. We don't hear much about Miss, Mrs. Prodigal in the story, however, but we do hear a lot about Mr. So can you imagine Mr. and Mrs. Prodigal raising this precious little guy, changing his diaper, cleaning up his little boogies, cleaning up the puke and all that stuff that babies do, Loving their child, teaching him respect, teaching him how to garden, teaching him how to wash dishes. He hated washing dishes, though. Didn't want to go near the dishwasher. Didn't like scooping the cat box, either. Taught him how to drive the donkey. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Prodigal loved their boy. Cherished him. One day, he turned to them and he said, Mom and Dad, I'm done. I don't want you anymore. Had enough of your thumb on my back. I want out of here. Give me my inheritance and let me go. Can you imagine what they experienced in that moment? I can get a glimpse of that. I'm a daddy. My daughter's up here in the front row. She's 16. I got a little boy named Noah. We were blessed with both of these two through adoption. And I, so when I saw them both for the first time, I saw Haley at the age of three walking up my driveway, just to be bopping up my driveway, little pigtails flopping around. She was happy. She got into our house within 10 minutes of being in our house. She brushed her teeth. Didn't button her buttons, though. Her, her button on her pants, she didn't know how to snap that back up, so she came back into us with the pants all wide open, the zipper down. It's one of the biggest fears I have preaching, coming up here with my fly down. One time this happened back, back in Colorado. I was getting ready to preach, and I skipped to the loo, as it were, and my button flew off my pants like a jet rocket and slammed into the porcelain. And I thought, oh, heavens, what shall I do? It was about 10 minutes. So I, that was the first thing I shared, actually, when I got to preach that day, is I have no button on my pants. So this could be a really wild ride. <clears throat> but a parent loves their child, wants the best for them. Yesterday, I had the, the privilege, Jennifer and I, to see my my daughter, I say my little girl, she's about 6'1", 6'2", do a JROTC competition, and she was pulling a Humvee. They pulled it as a team and did an awesome job. She's out in lead pulling this thing. Then she and another friend just decided, why don't we just go do it just ourselves? And they just went ahead and did it themselves, pulled this 8,500, 9,000-pound vehicle just for giggles, <laughs> just for fun. My boy loves to, loves to read books, taught himself how to play the piano. He loves to write books and little cartoons. Both of my kids are so stinking creative. I love them so much. I look at them sometimes in my heart. I just want to just explode. I'm so proud of my babies. Imagine what Mr. and Mrs. Prodigal were going through. Whew. So then the son's sitting there in the pig slop, covered in pig poop, thinking, man, if I could just eat some of these pig pods... I could fill my gut. I know if I was home right now, even as a servant of my father, I'd have food to eat. I'd have dry clothes. I'd have soap, something. Can you imagine the fear he experienced? They're not going to accept me. They don't love me anymore. I can't go back. I can't. Imagine the nation of Israel in Babylonian captivity. God's never going to take us back. Never going to take us back. He decided against all odds to have some courage, walk home. His dad, Mr. Prodigal, was looking out the window, saw his boy coming up the driveway and ran out to meet him. Didn't give his son a chance to even come to the door. Covered him in kisses, hugged him, loved him, said, my son, I have missed you. Welcome home. That's how our father greets us. Truth number one, you don't have to live in fear. Truth number two, you have been redeemed. Truth number three, 
You are loved and cherished. I have called you by name. You are mine. Truth number three, you are loved and cherished. The enemy of your soul calls you by your sin. Jesus calls you by your name. God is always present and calling to us no matter what we have done or how we feel about him. The lies that we believe matter not to God. He knows how he feels about us. And he loves us and cherishes us no matter what. John 3, 16, first verse my little daughter ever memorized at three years of age. She used to recite it to me. It's the cutest thing ever. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting, everlasting life. Jeremiah 1.5, God says to the prophet Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Friends, while you were being knit together in the womb, God knew your name. He had a purpose for you, a plan for you. Before you were brought into the world, he knew exactly what he wanted for you. And then the lies start coming into our lives. We begin believing these things. And it takes us away from that divine purpose. Psalm 139, one of my favorite passages, verses 1 through 10. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. God knows exactly where you are right now, friends. He knows what you are believing about yourself right now. He knows the sins you have committed. He knows the plans that he has for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11 is a verse I claim for both my kids. I've got it tattooed here on my arm. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So you may ask the question, well, if he wants to give me a hope and a future, what about the bad stuff? Because I've experienced a lot of bad stuff in my life. And bad stuff stinks. Yeah, there's no question about that. We live in a sinful, fallen world. When people ask me, why did this happen, Patrick? Why? Why did God allow this to happen? I don't know the answer. But I do know God is good. And we can trust him. Jennifer got laid off from her job back in 2008. She worked at Focus on the Family about 11 years. I've been with Focus almost 24. And uh, I remember hearing about this from a friend whose husband just lost his, his job. She said, Jennifer just lost her job. They pulled about 100 people into one room. The way that Focus was changing things, they said, you got three months left. We're going to give you a severance package. But you, you've lost your Jennifer loved her job. So good at it. She is such a hard worker. So she was devastated. She was crying and, and upset and miserable. But in that very moment, in that moment, friends, God spoke to me and said, now you guys can adopt a kid. We've been waiting for a kid for a long time. 18 years married, nothing happened. Two people working, both going to Mexico, taking cruises. We would have never probably ventured into that space unless God shook things up. He shook things up. So I go bebopping across the street, all happy and laughing, teehee-in, go to see my bride. Guess what? Guess what God told me? She was in her cubicle. <laughs> Again, this was a time when I did not read the room well <laughs> with my bride. So I said, guess what? God said, we're going to be able to adopt now. She didn't want to hear that in the moment. But that's what happened. Three years later, my precious little daughter went skipping up my driveway. We met our son a few years after that. And it's just amazing. But that happened because of something that wasn't all that good. We live in a sinful and fallen world. Chuck Swindoll says this. 
I'm convinced that 10% of what happens to me, 10% life is 10% of what happens to me, and 90% how I react to it. What can I do in the moment to keep my heart open to God? Because when something bad happens, my first reaction is to say, why? Can I remind myself of the truth? I don't have to live in fear. I've been redeemed. He loves me and cherishes me. That's the truth. The enemy would tell you, he doesn't love you. You're worthless. You are no good. No one loves you, in fact. You might as well just throw in the towel. That closes the heart. The truth will keep the heart open, allow you to stay trusting, obedient. Ephesians 2.10, Paul says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When we are walking in the truth, friends, we are able to step into and walk in what God has called us and created us for, how he has created us to be, not necessarily what he's created us to do. He's called us to be in relationship with him, to live and walk in the truth. To not believe those lies. Three simple truths. You may have come in here this morning believing something about yourself that wasn't true. You can walk out those doors today knowing these three simple concrete truths. You do not have to live in fear, truth number one. Do you have to live in fear? No. All right. Truth number two, you have been redeemed, redeemed truth number two. Truth number three, you are loved and cherished. Who loves and cherishes you? Does everyone in the world love and cherish you? And they don't have to. But you can love and cherish your God and show up as a servant of his and see what he does with that. See what he does with you. Father, we love you. Thank you for life. Thank you for the ability to hear and understand the truth of your word. Your word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce through bone and marrow. You are able to bring life to the dead. You are able to bring joy to the miserable. You are able to bring peace to the chaos. God, thank you for allowing us the awesome privilege and opportunity to worship in the house of God freely. Thank you for allowing us the ability and the honor of praising you loudly in this place. Receive our worship, our love. Help us to be grounded in your truth. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.